you know, the numbers are so bad for most of the fiat currency countries that it won't take much to tip some of them over. And then, you know, then it becomes a free for all. Then it becomes, uh, you know, not who's next, but which one or two countries are going to survive this process that destroys all the other financial systems. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for March 7th through March 14th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature two four nines fine silver coins, 2022 silver maples at $3.40 over spot, and the 2023 silver kangaroo at just $3.39 over spot. Silver maples were the first silver sovereign coins to be minted at four nines fine purity and remain one of the most in-demand coins today. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a box, and are available at the lowest premium we've seen in more than a year, at just $3.40 over spot. The 2023 Silver Kangaroo from Australia also offers 4 nines fine purity and comes 25 to a tube. However, the Australian Monster Box is just 250 coins, making it the most affordable Monster Box available, especially with a premium of just $3.39 over spot per ounce. Both coins this week are also IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a Precious Metals IRA, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order these specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend, John Rubino, founder of dollarcollapse.com, now on Substack, rubino.substack.com. We'll put a link in the description of this video to that uh, Substack. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Elijah, thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to have you, and I wanted to discuss your latest article. It's titled, How a Country Goes Bankrupt in 10 Steps. So if we can go over those 10 steps, but it's really about how Japan is going bankrupt right now. Um, and a lot of the points and steps there, I also see the U.S. is doing kind of on the same road as well. But if we want to start with Japan, the first step is uh, build up massive debt. Can you expand, expand on that? Yeah. Well, actually, as you said, everybody's doing the same thing. You know, we're all making these same mistakes. Japan is just further along because they had their, um, you know, defining real estate bubble back in the 1990s. They, they had, you know, look that up. It's one of the most amazing real estate bubbles that have ever happened. There's, there's some stat like the, um, you know, the, the real estate in Tokyo was worth more than everything in California or something like that at the time. It was really an incredible bubble. And when it burst, it um, threatened to blow up the entire economy because an awful lot of people were involved in it. And there were, you know, these giant banks and giant uh, construction companies. And the government had a choice, um, as all governments do when a bubble bursts, um, either take the pain, let all that debt be um, eliminated through default, accept a nasty recession and get on with things, or try to bail everybody out. And Japan made the choice that all the rest of us have made in the ensuing few decades uh, to bail everybody out. They, um, they, they ran massive deficits. They threw that money at the zombie construction companies and zombie banks. Uh, and kept those um, those entities kind of shambling along, but at the cost of massive um, government debt going forward. Uh, and then when the debt started to become onerous, they started cutting interest rates dramatically until they got back down into negative territory, where they could and actually make money by borrowing because people were paying them um, to buy their debt. Uh, and um, they did that for a while and build up even more and more debt. And, and so they, they reached a point where uh, government debt in Japan um, uh, comes to about 260 percent of GDP, which is maybe the biggest number that any country has ever run up in the history of government borrowing. Um, but, you know, eventually that wasn't going to work. And. Over the years, um, people have been betting against the yen and betting against the Japanese stocks and um, expecting all that debt to blow up on them. And it hasn't worked and it hasn't worked. And so that, you know, the, the short Japan bet has come to be known as the widow maker because it never seemed to work. You could never bet against Japan because somehow they were able to borrow even more money and keep the thing going longer than anybody expected. But um, just lately, 
after the pandemic and after everybody else created huge amounts of money and dumped it into the system, we finally got inflation from all the, the debt that we've been taking on. And Japan's inflation has gone up to about 4% right now. Now, if your bonds are yielding zero and your inflation rate is 4%, that's a negative 4% yield on bonds in your country. And um, that's clearly unsustainable. And it, it finally bit for Japan. Um, the yen started to tank and interest rates started to go up as nobody wanted to touch Japanese bonds. So the Bank of Japan had to first let the interest rate go up to 0.25% from zero on the 10-year treasury. Then they couldn't hold that. And they had to let it go up to 0.5%. And that's where they are now. They're in this, um, this battle with the marketplace, which thinks Japanese bonds ought to yield a lot more given 4% Japanese inflation and um, a currency that's falling hard. Um, and it's not clear that the central bank can win this battle because if they uh, if they hold the line on interest rates or try to push interest rates back down, then that's going to be perceived as inflationary. Everybody's going to sell off the yen and the yen is going to tank. But if they let interest rates go up to try to control inflation and protect the yen, um, then their interest costs go through the roof. You know, they've got, uh, well, with 260% um, debt to GDP, um, a 1% interest rate on their bonds would cost them 2.6% of GDP every year just in interest. And that's a totally unsustainable burden. And 1% is probably not where it stops because um, the US 10 year treasury bond yields 4% right now. Why is Japan's yielding less? You know, it makes no sense in this world anymore. So, so Japan is on the verge of what looks like a death spiral where no matter what they do, there's a feedback loop that makes things worse and worse for their financial system. Uh, and so I think it's, it's completely possible that um, they lose the battle with interest rates in the coming year. And then that's basically it. That's the end of the financial system as they designed it. Um, and, um, you know, it's both a disaster for anybody who trusted the Japanese government and held on to yen, which will have to be um, devalued dramatically. Um, and it's a sign of things to come for the rest of the world, because, as I said, they're, they're ahead of us, but they're not that far ahead. You know, we're all making these same mistakes and we will all meet the same fate at some point. So that's why Japan's important, because it's a, a little glimpse of our future. It is a little glimpse of our future, it seems like, because, as you mentioned, yeah, they're going down the same road. Uh, we're going down the same road as they are. But uh, it seems like everything comes to a head. You mentioned in the article where things start to happen suddenly. Where are we right now uh, for Japan? When does this really come to a head, in your opinion? Well, if you look at charts for um, the past year, you see the yen taking a sudden dive versus the dollar. It, it lost something like 20% of its value in a very short time and Japanese interest rates spiking. And again, this is just in the past year. Uh, they went from zero on the 10-year treasury to 0.25, and then in another spike up to 0.5. So those two charts look very sudden in terms of in, in financial time, you know? And, and so it's completely possible that we're in the suddenly part of the process now where, um, you know, the Bank of Japan is just not going to be able to, to defend the 0.5% line and interest rates are going to spike again. Well, if they do, you know, if they spike, like I said, to 1%, that's a debilitating level right there. Um, and if the yen drops much from here, uh, it's liable to take on a life of its own. So we could easily see the coming year uh, being the suddenly part of Japanese bankruptcy. You know, there, there's no way to predict the future with any kind of accuracy, but um, we we are in a period of sudden moves down in the yen, up in interest rates. Let those two continue, and uh, you know, next year will look brutally worse for Japan than this year does. So, uh, you know, we could be there. In other words, and what are kind of the stages of that uh, sudden collapse of the currency? You mentioned uh, kind of step eight through ten there, and it ends in game over. It starts with uh, desperately trying to lower interest rates. If you can take us through kind of what to expect from J Japan, maybe in this next coming year or so, if we do start seeing a collapse there. Well, if interest rates go up, everybody starts doing the numbers, right? Where they, they say, all right, Japan has this much debt. 
how much is it going to cost at current rates as all their debt rolls over at these new rates? And the numbers will be hair raising. They'll absolutely terrify people, which means that nobody will want to own Japanese financial assets, which means that the Bank of Japan is already buying most of the bonds that are issued by the government. Well, they'll have to buy them all because nobody will want to touch them. No private sector entity is going to want to own Japanese bonds in a, in a situation where the government is rapidly going bankrupt. Uh, so the central bank will then have to try to push interest rates back down because they'll perceive that as their only choice. Because the other choice is, you know, two trillion dollars worth of uh, uh, of interest going out the door. That that's the U.S. case. We will we'll be um, at two trillion dollars if interest rates go back up to historically normal levels. Uh, for Japan, it would be three, four, five percent of GDP of in, in interest going out the door which leaves no room for anything else, which means the government is effectively bankrupt, which means nobody wants to own their bonds. So the, the Bank of Japan will try to push interest rates back down. But to do that, they'll have to buy all the bonds, which is basically modern monetary theory territory. And, and then we'll get the catastrophe that everybody knows would flow from that. But it, it, in buying up all the bonds, they'll push the pressure over to the yen. Since nobody wants to own bonds and the government is financing all the Japanese government's borrowing, nobody will then want to hold yen because that there's still a private sector market for yen. And so the yen will start to plunge in value. And the Bank of Japan and the Japanese government realize, and everybody else will realize, that there's no way out of this. You know, there's only some kind of a monetary reset where you devalue the currency hugely, you know, a banana republic devaluation where you lob a bunch of zeros off. Uh, and um, and then hope that that puts you back on a sustainable path. But in the process, it impoverishes everybody who trusted the government. Um, the people who have big yen bank accounts or own a bunch of government bonds or um, have their money in pension funds that own those things, they'll all be impoverished. Uh, and then you get massive civil unrest regime change, yada, yada, you know, the whole gigantic financial crisis scenario plays out. Uh, and that's really the inevitable result of taking on this much debt. There's no way around this now because the numbers can't be made to work beyond a certain point. So our question is, is, is this the point, you know, and it, it could well be for Japan. Um, and if it is, then it is also, you know, beyond the point of return for a lot of other countries. Now, when it comes to really this happening in a, a big country, right? We're looking at a, a first world nation here, it seems like, um, with Japan. Your perspective on what this means, it seems like we haven't seen something like this in recent history. Um, this serious of a country, right, going into maybe hyperinflation or a serious crisis with the currency. Uh, how does that impact the rest of the financial world? Well, when, when something big like that happens to a, a legit entity in any field, the natural reaction is to start looking around going, wow, who's next? If it can happen to them, can it happen to us? Who, who, who is the next one that's going to go? Um, and there are many candidates for um, bankrupt government post-Japan. You know, there, there are a lot of other countries that are uh, in very bad financial shape. Um, China uh, has had a um, gigantic real estate bubble that is now kind of sort of bursting. Um, most of Europe has um, government numbers that don't look that much better than Japan. The US, I mean, we're the biggest netter, debtor nation in the history of the human race. Uh, and, you know, our government debt is up to about 130% of GDP right now. But um, we have a lot more private sector debt than Japan did. So if you take our total debt, uh, it's as bad as Japan's. So once you start looking around, you, fi you find all kinds of potential candidates. Uh, and so then it becomes a question of, well, you know, who are we going to uh, bet against um, most aggressively? And, you know, you could look at Italy or somebody like that and think that's a bankruptcy candidate waiting to happen. And, or you could, um, you could assume that um, with the idiots in charge of the U.S. right now, that uh, we're going to try and fight World War III with um, two different nuclear powers at the same time. And we're going to use that as an excuse to build up our military budget beyond any reason. At the same time, we're running cradle to grave entitlement. You know, we're, we're going to keep spending incredible amounts of money no matter what. And maybe you bet against the dollar. You know, it's, uh, it's a target-rich environment 
but that will be the play. People will be looking back at, oh, when George Soros broke the Bank of England, how did he do it? Well, let's do that again. Let's replicate that with other countries. So the, um, the short fiat currency play comes into style in a big way. Uh, and you, you see a lot of hedge funds and other big financial entities attacking these various currencies. No way to know who, who gets attacked first, who goes first, and, and exactly how it plays out. But it will be the kind of thesis that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. So you'll see a lot of people trying to put variations of that into place. Uh, and you know the numbers are so bad for most of the fiat currency countries that it won't take much to tip some of them over and then you know then it becomes a free for all and it becomes uh you know not who's next but which one or two countries are going to survive this process that destroys all the other financial systems so uh, yeah it's uh it's that kind of waterfall thing or the uh you know very gradually then suddenly thing but applied to the fiat currency world in general, not just specific countries that screwed up in their own specific ways. Uh, that was always out there. That was always a thing that was going to happen. But um, a big country getting into trouble in the way Japan might in the not too distant future, that could set the whole thing off. That is very interesting. What you say is it's almost, a, I guess, for nations and, and uh, maybe leaders and also just investors out there, it's kind of a more of a psychological thing that hits them is oh wait a second this can actually happen you know the first time for a serious country and maybe since weimar germany if you could correct me on that but um my understanding that was probably the the previous hyperinflation for like a large country out there um it seems like people nowadays think well you know that can't happen uh in our modern financial world but if this if this happens with japan it'll be a really a uh, wake-up call for everyone yeah, yeah, we've seen lots of um, uh, not so consequential countries screw up their finances and have to do big monetary resets and try to claw their way out of the you know that that crisis. But because it hasn't happened to a, a big serious country for such a long time, we've developed this idea that countries of that stature are immune to the laws of finance when they, they really aren't. It's just that it takes a lot more for one of them to blow up because we have a lot more faith in them. But, um, you know, faith is the kind of thing that takes a long time to build up, but can be destroyed very quickly. And, and that that's the risk now is that uh, one big serious country, just like one big serious bank, you know, let's say Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse blow up here then that's the same kind of problem for the banking center. Everybody's looking at or the banking system. Everybody's looking at what's next and they find a lot of potential candidates. Well, same thing with fiat currencies um, and the governments that run them. Let one of these guys go and then all of a sudden everybody else is seen in a different light. So, yeah, fun times. <laughs> There's a whole new category of, of short strategies that flow from all this. So it's possible to make a fortune by getting something like this right. But, um, you know, as, as we found out with Japan, it's, it's really hard to get the timing of it right. So, um, so I, I wouldn't recommend that um, regular people go out and start shorting all the big fiat currencies. But uh, some sophisticated people are going to do that and they're going to time it right. And they're going to be like the guys in the, uh, the big short movie who, um, who, who saw the problem, identified how to exploit it and made life changing money. You know, that's going to happen again, but it's going to be with... Uh, the financial systems of the big fiat currency countries. And I know your next article will be addressing that some ways to possibly short Japan. We can't give financial advice, but if you want to give us some sort of preview of that a next article that's coming out next week. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not done with it yet, so I don't have a lot of the details, but uh, just conceptually, there are Japan-centric ETFs that have options that trade on them. So you can buy put options on mutual funds effectively that um, that represent big pieces of the Japanese economy. You know, there's a, a yen ETF, so you can buy a put option on a yen ETF and you're betting against the yen. You can do that with the Nikkei um, stock market average in Japan. And, uh, you know, there, there may be ways to do it with government bonds. 
from Japan. I'm looking at that now too. But uh, that's that's the quick, simple way of doing it. There are you know credit default swaps and things like that that you can use. That's more of a sophisticated game, though. Um, that's a, a hedge fund thing, you know. But uh, as long as you've got an ETF with put options on it, you really don't have to get fancier than that. You can just make that kind of a bet, and uh, and you are exposed to that kind of action if it happens. So. Uh, I'll look into it. I'll publish something next week uh, and, um, you know, kind of test the, the feasibility of this stuff before I publish. Well, that'll definitely be interesting to um, uh, see that article next week. Um, I did want to touch on, it seems like maybe a less sophisticated way to uh, bet against the yen or fiat currencies is also uh, holding precious metals. If you want to share with the viewers, uh, once again, you kind of your perspective on that and how you think precious metals will fare uh, in this crisis if uh, Japan goes under. Well, yeah, gold and silver are, are kind of implicit shorts against the big fiat currencies because they're the kind of money that um, that governments can't inflate away. Therefore, because they stay rare, they hold their value and they will go up when the dollar and the yen and the euro and pound sterling um, really plunge. And, uh, and by the way, those currencies might not plunge against each other because they're all falling, but they'll, they'll plunge at irregular rates versus real stuff like gold and silver. So I think conceptually gold and silver is something you absolutely have to own right here. But I'm a little worried about the, uh, the next three to six months because of what's happening with central banks. Um, they've been tightening aggressively um, to counter the inflation that we got by creating all that new money to uh, bail out everybody in sight during the pandemic. Uh, and um, interest rates have gone up dramatically in a lot of different places. And just today, um, Chairman Powell of the US Fed came out and said, rates are gonna stay up higher for longer than people are expecting. Uh, and, and that's true, the central banks think they, um, they really, really can't give up before inflation is squeezed out of the economy. And in the last couple of weeks, some numbers came out that implied that that's not the case yet. You know, the US had a um, really good jobs number, which means wage inflation. Um, they had um, a really good retail sales number, which means higher consumer price inflation out there. Um, and then over in, in Europe, um, inflation for the Eurozone countries jumped up uh, sequentially by 0.8%. Um, and that is an unacceptably high increase in inflation for the ECB. So we're going to see the central banks tighten, maybe more than a lot of people expected even a couple of months ago. And that's going to break something. They're going to basically tighten until they break something in the financial markets. So we could see a, a serious capitulation in stocks. And if that happens, then it's 2008 or 2020 again when, when stocks really tanked. And they took gold and silver down with them. So we could easily see a sharp V bottom kind of plunge in gold and silver, uh, which will be followed by a huge run when the central banks take that as their signal to start easing again. But you don't really want to be fully invested when that happens. So with with um, gold and silver, I think you know we're back to the dollar cost averaging as being the best way of um, of investing in precious metals. Don't you know, jump with both feet in any given month or even any given year, put the same dollar amount into gold and silver every month. And then when it's up, you buy fewer ounces. And when it's down, um, you buy more ounces. So your average price works out in the end. And, and I think that's the only way you can really deal with something this uncertain, because we just don't know when the central banks are going to capitulate. Doesn't look like yet. And it, you know, the longer they don't, the longer they stay tight and continue to tighten, the greater the odds of a serious break in the stock market become. So I think we're heading into a time when that becomes a very real possibility. And it's just not a great time to have put your life savings into precious metals if that happens. So um, definitely be buying gold and silver, don't stop, but um, don't make this the month when you make your big move in those things, because it's really not a good time to do that. Dollar cost effort averaging definitely seems like a good idea to really spread that price out there and, and be prepared for really whatever happens. And maybe, you know, keeping some cash on the side too, to take advantage of opportunities. Absolutely. Dry powder is a really good thing to have at a time like this because um, 
Well, if you look back at just the, the two most recent examples, um, a lot of things got insanely cheap. Uh, I don't know if you remember a little um, gold mining explorer named Great Bear Resources, but uh, that's that's been one of the ones that, uh, one of the very few that have made a lot of money for people in the, the mining sector. And that stock um, in 2020, okay, that stock had run up from pennies to uh, $10, I think. And in 2020, when everything tanked, it went back down to $2. And then it subsequently went up to $23 before it was bought out. So that that short, sharp break right there was a bad time to own that stock, but a great time to be buying it at the bottom. And I think we'll see a lot of things like that, where people just panic and they dump a lot of really high quality equities. Um, and obviously high quality bullion like gold and silver, but they just they panic sell. And they uh, basically throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if you've got some cash on hand at the time, you can um, you can get some of your favorites at a really nice sale price. So understand what it is you want to own, and then watch and see if we don't get that short, sharp break in the stock market coming up here, and and see if some of your uh, your favorite things don't suddenly get fifty percent cheaper because it com- could completely happen. And we've got historical precedents within just the uh, you know the last couple of decades so this this looks like one of those times again and uh, it would be really nice to be on exactly the right side of that process for once thank you so much john for joining us today before we let you go where can our viewers find you online if they're interested in learning more yeah sub uh, rubino.substack.com i'm uh, doing a lot of writing there you can sign up for free to check out what i'm doing and then some of the the really nitty gritty investment stuff is behind a paywall. You can decide if it's worth um, signing up for a paid subscription, but you can get a lot free. So rubino.substack.com. Once again, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.